Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're just going to wait a second just to make sure everyone gets in and connected and we'll start in just a second. All right, it looks like most everyone is in here. So I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the program today. Um, my name is Eva Ann Johnson. I'm from the Wilmette Public Library. I'm an adult services librarian there and I do genealogy and local history related things. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone to this program. Uh, this is one of our first programs in the One Book Everyone Reads series. Um, the One Book Everyone Reads is a community reads program where we encourage everyone in the community to read uh, the same book and then we have a series of programs related to the themes in that book. And this year's book was Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu. Um, our signature author event where Charles Yu is going to come and speak to everyone is going to be on Wednesday, April 14th at 7 p.m. Um, the full lineup of all the events related to this book is going to be on our website, which is wilmetlibrary.info. And you can learn more about our One Book Everyone Reads events um, right here. I'm going to put the link in the chat there. So if you're interested in um, similar things related to the Chinese American experience or related to this book, um, check out the upcoming events there. Um, you can also watch for upcoming genealogy programs this spring and fall and summer as well on our calendar or by signing up for our genealogy newsletter. Um, if you're interested in getting the genealogy newsletter from the Wilmette Library, here is the link to that as well. Um, a big thank you to the friends of the Wilmette Library who help us fund the One Book Everyone Reads programs and to North Suburban Genealogical Society who are co-sponsoring this program with us. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over to Linda and Terry of the North Suburban Genealogical Society who are going to talk briefly about the North Suburban Genealogical Society and their upcoming events. So Hi, my name is Linda Dooley and I am the president of North Suburban Genealogical Society. I'm very happy that we are able to partner with the Wilmette Library and bringing uh, education to about the Chinese, an, uh, Chinese ancestry. It's something I'm unfamiliar with and I'm looking forward to learning more about it and also participating in their one book read. Uh, North Suburban Genealogy Society has been active since 1975. We have a website, nsgsil.org and a Facebook page. And you just have to put in Northbrook Genealogical Society and we will pop up. Um, so today is our March meeting and we're ready for the next screen, Terry. Uh, we welcome any of the attendees who are not members. Uh, if you like, if you're interested in genealogy, we welcome you to join our society. Uh, it's $25 a year and the programs range from January through December. Uh, we have a newsletter and it is uh, sent e via email. However, if you wanted a paper newsletter, uh, the fee would be $35 and forms are on our website, nsgsil.org. Thank you. Part of, the, um, part of what we offer are some write, our writers groups. We have three different writers groups, um, a morning, an afternoon, and an evening, and they all meet on Mondays. And I invite any members and any Wilmette Library patron guests to, um, to join in, try it out, see if you like the idea of writing about your family history. Um, all you have to do is just send me an email. Uh, it's president at nsgsil.org and you can find my email address online. We also offer a DNA discovery group and we usually we meet the last Friday of the month at 1 p.m. and that Friday is March 26th and I invite any interested people 
um, to join in. We're a group that's been work, been in, been studying DNA for about two years, and we teach each other. We work together. Okay, Terry. And uh, we have monthly meetings, uh, usually on the second uh, Saturday of the month. And next month's meeting, April 12th, be on cemetery symbolism. Um, when you walk through a cemetery, sometimes you see headstones with symbols on them and you're not, and we're not familiar with it. It was very popular, especially in the Victorian area, era to put symbols on the cemetery. The ones we're familiar with probably are the Masonic symbols, but we have Laurel Mellian in April coming to talk to us about all of the cemetery symbolism. In May, uh, we have Tina Baird, who um, will be talking about cyber sleuthing your family tree. So that's a great program for beginners as well as experienced uh, researchers. It tells you what websites you can use and it's very informative. So we welcome all of our members and guests to those uh, meetings as well. Um, there was also a Roots Tech, um, this, the um, conference, and it was held as a virtual event this year. It was in February. However, uh, you can go to the rootstech.org website, and they have all of their uh, sessions and presentations recorded. And I checked it last night, and I think that any uh, public member can still access those. And those are very helpful if you're getting started in genealogy or uh, family history work. And um, it's a great resource, and it's free. There's another conference coming up in, in um, June, June 4th and 5th, um, and that's put on by the Southern California Genealogical Society. And uh, that one is uh, a fee to, to attend. Um, they have two sessions, one on genetic genealogy and then one on the general gen genealogy jamboree. And uh, there are discounts for early registering, registration and there's their website posted. And now um, I'd like to turn it back over to Eva, um, who can introduce our speaker for today, Kelly Summers. So yes, today I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, first, I wanted to mention that the handout for today's program uh, was sent to you in an email earlier today, and it's, there's also a link to it in the chat. Um, and if you have any questions or comments throughout the program, just put those in the chat or the Q&A panel, and uh, we'll get to those toward the end of the program. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Kelly Summers, accredited genealogist. Uh, she currently works as a part-time faculty member at Brigham Young University teaching family history. She also teaches online genealogy courses at Salt Lake Community College. Kelly has four premier genealogical credentials through the International Commission for the Accreditation of Professional Genealogists, or ICAP-GEN demonstrating genealogical research expertise in the U.S. and multiple countries. Kelly currently serves as the president for the Utah Genealogical Association. Uh, Kelly has been involved in genealogical research and teaching for more than 30 years. She conducts genealogical research in the U.S., Latin America, and southwestern European areas and China. Kelly's research interests lie in kinship research, in primary source records, and rural community reconstruction. Kelly began learning some basic traditional Mandarin Chinese some years ago in order to help her Asian students conduct genealogical research. In November 2019, she traveled to Guangdong, China on a family history research trip and was able to visit several family villages. In January 2020, Kelly coordinated a week-long genealogical institute course called Chinese Genealogy, Research Methods and Sources for the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy. Attendees came from across the US and Canada. Kelly will teach this same course for the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy, but in a virtual format in fall 2021. So thank you so much, Kelly, for coming. And I'd like to turn it over to you for our program. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and choose the right one. 
And this is my family, which will disappear as soon as my screen pops up. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm, this is a topic I'm very excited to uh, share about, all the things that I've learned. And um, I think it's a topic that there's a lot of interest in, but a lot of people are maybe a little hesitant if they have Chinese ancestry because there's some obstacles also. And there are obstacles in any area of research, but this one has some additional obstacles. So let's go ahead and learn about the beginning steps to finding your Chinese ancestors. Okay, so there's been a great interest in uh, learning about our families, our heritage, our culture, our ancestry, and people become interested in this for many reasons. Sometimes it's because they know that the, it's part of their core identity. It's a part of who they are, the influences of the heritage, the background that they came from. Uh, many times it's because they want to make connections. And this is a way to develop relationships with maybe extended family members that you've not known about or haven't been close to. Many people feel that yearning to belong, uh, to belong to a family, to belong to a clan or group. Uh, they want to understand why does my mother or my father or my grandmother do things this way? What is the motivation behind that? Um, as we learn about the heritage and culture, we can begin to understand uh, some of the reasons for these things and these beliefs as well. Uh, many studies recently has, have shown that um, actually learning about your ancestors and your family members uh, brings, uh, allows a child to be more resilient in the struggles that they may face uh, on a regular basis, just the challenges as you, you go through life. And it also increases a feeling of self-worth. And so any one of those are great reasons to pursue finding about your ancestry. And I hope that you have fun as we go along here. Okay, so here are some of the obstacles that people who have Chinese ancestry may face. Uh, they, they may not speak the language, uh, which is a very difficult language, and they may not be able to even read the characters. They may not uh, know anything about the family in China, or maybe the family here doesn't talk about the family in China. There's a lot of reasons that, that uh, a lot of these things can be challenges. I'm going to give you some ideas that hopefully can help you get over some of these challenges. And I want you to know right off that you don't have to speak or read Chinese in order to begin this work. Uh, there's a lot of groundwork that can be done uh, before you get to the point where you need to learn a little bit of, of the language. Okay, so one of the first steps and this is a pretty universal when we begin genealogical research, but it's especially important when you have Chinese ancestry is to begin collecting information about your family. And you begin with your immediate family, asking them what they know, what they remember, and uh, then go back, start asking the next generation about what they know. With uh, regard to Chinese ancestry, the most valuable information will probably come from the elders in the family and asking them questions about what they remember. Um, and as you're asking questions, make sure that you're recording this, whether you're recording it um, as an audio or you're taking notes. Because even if you think you can remember these details, you won't. There will be so many different uh, little pieces to this puzzle and you will need to record every piece to put it all together. So make sure you're taking notes or preserving the answers that your elders give in some way. Okay, uh, the goal in doing uh, Chinese research is to get a family genealogy book or a clan genealogy. This is called a Jiaqi. And this book, contains many generations of the paternal line. Um, I have seen some that contain, have documented 80 generations or more. Some start with 20. And so it, it contains a wealth of information. 
And these are, are highly prized and very valuable in the family and uh, they are kept. So each family has one or has had one. In order to access this book, you need to know two things. And the first thing is you need to be able to identify your surname character. So this means the Chinese character, not the Romanized spelling, but the actual character. And additionally, you need to be able to identify your ancestral village, um, know where the location is. If you have those two pieces of information, then you will have a better chance at accessing that clan genealogy book. In some cases, uh, this clan genealogy, there may be a copy or a portion of a copy here in America that a family member may have brought with them. However, most of these will be found in China. And then uh, as, you, as you get deeply into this, there are some organizations that have also spent time collecting and digitizing uh, these books and making them available online. Okay, as you uh, begin your journey in collecting information, ask some questions. And I've made a list in the handout and here I'll talk about some of these questions that will be important to know about. And uh, as, so again, thinking of that the goal is to find the surname, character, and the ancestral home, then all of these questions will be able to put that information together. So asking straight out, um, do you know where the ancestral home is located? And many times the ancestral home is a very small village. And so getting the name of that village in addition to other information about what's the nearest market town or city and what province or county is that in within China. Uh, additionally, asking about the ancestral hall. The ancestral hall is a location where many times there are memorial tablets um, erected in remembrance of their ancestors. And these tablets will record the names and sometimes additional information about many generations going back in time. When I began this presentation, there was an image on the front, on one of the images was an image of these ancestral tablets. And usually there is a hall or a building where these tablets will be kept and preserved. Um, another question that would be helpful is, do you know where our ancestors are buried? And is there a family cemetery? So this question can apply to China as well as here in the US. If you can locate a tombstone with a Chinese inscription, that may also give you some good uh, information about your ancestral home. Okay, other questions. Do we have a family genealogy book. This is called the Japu, and here's an image of um, one particular style of Japu, where it shows this particular one, uh, shows multiple generations. Here we have a generation, and this person had this child, and this person had this child, and on down, and then we can see multiple generations that just found out where there are multiple children. And these are names. And so you can find those names and then you may be able to go at another part of the book and find uh, dates that uh, about birth or death and marriage information. So this is the book that we want to get a hold of if at all possible. Another question to ask would be, does our family use generational names? Uh, it's a custom or it was a custom in China that there would be a family poem. And usually this poem was created by one of the ancestors and the poem often would have 40 characters more or less. And this poem, if it was read, would, uh, would express the uh, ambitions and aspirations of this family and ancestor for his family, his posterity. And so usually he'll talk about uh, the things he wants them to be, the values he wants them to hold. And then this poem will be used to name the children of every generation. So the first character in that poem will be used for that man's children. And they will all, all the children of that generation of his descendants 
will carry the male children, especially, will carry that particular character in their name. And then the second character in the poem will go to the grandchildren and so forth. And uh, if the family is using this generational poem, it can be used to actually identify uh, distant relatives because all of the cousins on a certain generation will have that same character as part of their name. Okay, more questions. Who was the first person in your family to come from China? There have been many different waves of immigration, uh, leaving China and arriving in the US or other parts of uh, North America and Australia. And uh, if you can identify that person, you can get more information about your family in China. Uh, ask when did he come to the United States or Canada? And what, where did he arrive? If you can figure out some of those things that will allow you to get into some records, again, that would be very valuable to you. Another question, has our family been associated with a benevolent society here in the United States? And here happens to be a paper um, from a benevolent society. Often these benevolent societies were um, organized with a surname, a family name, um, primary, and he, all the people from that same family name would be associated with this benevolent society. And these societies were set up to help people, Chinese coming from China, to help get them established here in the United States and Canada, to help them find work and, and just get a foundation. And so these societies may have some records about your ancestor or the immigrant ancestor. Are there any letters or photos? Um, and sometimes we have memorabilia in, in the drawers, in the attic, some places like that. But if you can find any records, photos, letters, um, uh, tickets, passports, paperwork, uh, that has Chinese characters on it, uh, these may be helpful to you in identifying these details about your ancestor and other family members, uh, wedding and baby announcements. So look through those, there may be clues among those that will help you in your research. And then we need to ask personal questions, uh, collecting the data from our family. What is your full name? including alternate names. And again, these questions could apply to the, the generation previous or the, the immigrant ancestor. It was a common practice that um, Chinese, your Chinese ancestors would have had multiple names. They may have had a name that they were called and that was used within the family when that person was a child. Then they may have had an adult name and they may have had uh, maybe what you would call nicknames and, and maybe others. So asking for all the different variations of the name will help you because then you can search in, using multiple names uh, in the records for your ancestor. And then uh, the next question, when were, you when were you born? Well, this might be a simple question to us, but if you're asking this question to somebody who was born in China, uh, the answer might be a little different than you expect, or they may not know how to convert it into the calendar that we use. In China, they have used the lunar calendar. And uh, sometimes the easier question would be, can you tell me what zodiac year you were born in? And the zodiac year is a 12 year cycle, and they may be able to be more easily respond in that way. Again, asking what, what are the names of your parents? And when were they born? And what are the names of your siblings? And when were they born? And who are your grandparents and where were they born? So getting this kind of information is a good foundation because you may find as you're gathering this information that you have a relative, a cousin that has already done some research. And if you get in contact with them, maybe you can work together and share information. So maybe they already have some of the information you need, but gathering this information uh, and about the family will help you get there. Okay, and then don't forget that it's not just about 
the names, dates, and places, but there's so much more that can be asked and that should be asked and recorded and preserved. For example, ask, story, ask about the stories in the family. Uh, what do you remember about the family, about family traditions? Um, can you tell me about their occupation or uh, just, just about the history that they lived through? We all have had a different interesting experiences. And for us most recently, uh, our children may ask about what was your experience in COVID? But think about those kinds of questions. These would be important to preserve and share with the family. Okay, I mentioned uh, family records uh, that you could look for that may be found in, in the home. Photos, letters, obituaries. Again, any document with um, Chinese writing or any official looking government document uh, in English. Uh, receipts. Uh, and then even gravestones with Chinese characters, these will be of value, and family association records. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about uh, if you've come at this from the idea of genealogy and recording the information and, and putting it in a family tree, there are some differences between doing this for an English family or a family that speaks English and a, a family from China. Uh, for the names in China, their family name comes first. That would be our surname. The most important thing is going to identify them. And for them, the most important thing is their family surname, followed by, and the family surname is usually one character, but there are some that are two characters. And that name will be followed by personal names. So the personal name may be one or two characters. If they are using the generational poem, the middle name of that full name will usually be the generational poem name character. And then the, the last name, personal name, will be unique to that person. So another thing that you need to know is that women keep their maiden surname. When they marry, they don't give up their uh, maiden surname, and that's the, that's the surname they were born with. That, um, in fact, in the records, they're often not identified. Women are often not identified by their first name, but by their married surname only, followed by she, which means that's the, the maiden name. And I mentioned earlier on another uh, slide that there may be multiple names within the family. Uh, the milk name is the child name, they may have an adult name, um, and then they may have another title. Okay, so now dates also are written differently than we would expect or we're accustomed to right now. Again, the most important thing is first, and, or the largest thing is first, and in this case it's the year. And so it's organized by year, month, and day. And so if you were to see this information on a tombstone or on a document, this is how it would be organized with the year first. And again, the lunar calendar was the official calendar used in China until 1912. And the zodiac year calendar contains 12 different zodiac symbols that are animals. And uh, there's a, a 12 year rotation. Okay, places. Places again are organized, uh, set up a little differently. Again, the largest to the smallest, the most important thing first. So the country is first, followed by the province, which would be equivalent uh, to a state. And then a county, village, or city and village. And you may have additional jurisdictions in there. You might have a district or a region. And so the place could be, could be seven or eight uh, different names, uh, but you want to get all the way down to the tiniest village where the family lived. Okay, I uh, borrowed this little chart I found online because I thought it displayed well a concept that uh, if you're not familiar with uh, 
Chinese culture, a concept that is really important and I think is a great thing. Uh, there are different relationship words in Chinese and they're very specific, which will help you in your Chinese research. So in this case, I've got here in the center, um, me, I'm the first person. And then I have an older sister and a younger brother. I might have a younger sister and, and the older sister and the younger sister are, there's two different words for that. And there's a different word for an older brother and a younger brother, and then different words for their spouses. And as you go back in time, you have mom and dad, but mother's parents are called differently than father's parents. Here, we would just say uh, grandma and grandpa, we might say that, uh, for either paternal or maternal grandparents, but there are specific words, identifying words, relationship words for, um, grandparents on the mother's time side, which would be maternal grandparents or grandparents on the father's side. So as your relatives are talking, if they're using these relationship words, make sure you take note. And if you can't remember how the relationships go, find a chart and remember they're talking to you as if they're the main person. It's in relationship to them. So that if they're talking about their older brother, this might be your great um, uncle, but make sure you do it in relation to them. But go ahead and keep all of those little notes of what they're calling these relatives. Whoops. Okay. <clears throat> Again, preserve your information. Some of your talks as you're uh, collecting this information will be with a notebook. Uh, sometimes they're with relatives you don't see very often write everything down, especially when dealing with Chinese characters. Uh, if you have the character written, it's going to be easier for you to maintain that information. But I would encourage you again, not only to keep a record, uh, copy it, scan it, preserve it in some way in a digital format, and then share it. Share it with the other family so they can uh, use this and, and benefit from it. Okay, so now let's go back to China. Background history of China. For the time period in, when, in which many of the Chinese immigrants were leaving China uh, was about the time, just before or about the time of the collapse of the Qing Dynasty. And this was right around the early 1900s. And there was a lot of political unrest at this time. And following that time, there were other political things that went on. There was an invasion, there were wars. And so the people of China were in a difficult situation than the common people. They were surrounded by uh, maybe war and um, political unrest, uh, rebellions, and they were, very, they were struggling a lot. The main reason at this time that people left uh, China was to work, and these were typically men that left early on. To work outside of China was their goal, to send money back to their families, to support their families during this uh, economic difficult situation. And so many of them left with the intent that they would return back to their family, but they felt a great sense of responsibility to help provide for their family. And it's quite remarkable the work that they've been able to accomplish. There were other waves of immigration um, throughout the 1900s uh, due to other situations. Um, and so depending on the time frame, uh, people came from different places in China to uh, leave the area. Um, I ran across this map that I thought would be a visual help. I mentioned that the early waves of those leaving China they actually came from a small area in southern China in Guangdong province, probably uh, between uh, Guangdong and Fujian province. There, you probably have over 90% of, uh, that's where over 90% of the overseas Chinese came from. And they left to make money to send back to their family and they went to Canada, they went to the United States 
Uh, there were some that were forcibly sent uh, to uh, Central America and even South America. And then uh, there were large groups that went to Australia as well. And you'll find in modern days, there are uh, large communities of uh, Chinese in these locations. Uh, some of the first employment that the Chinese did in North America was the hard work of building railroads. And uh, it's quite remarkable what they were able to accomplish here. We see the Canadian Pacific Railway all the way across. Um, took a long period of time and it was the Chinese that spent uh, a lot of time working on that. And then here in the United States, we see uh, from the West to the Midwest, the US Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, but this was some of the first work uh, that, that the Chinese uh, laborers came to do. And then there were other things that they came to do as, as, as time went on. Now, um, so the Chinese uh, were here in the United States, probably they began coming probably around 1850 or so. Around 1881, 82, uh, a law was put in place called the Chinese Exclusion Act. And this law was put in place to hinder the immigration of Chinese to America. And this was law was put in place uh, for a 10 year period. And then they would reevaluate and decide. Uh, I think during this time, the Chinese were very hard workers and uh, resourceful. Imagine working for the railroad or some other uh, immigrant job and then being able to save enough money to send back to your family. Very frugal, uh, very thrifty, very, uh, very ingenious. The way they were able to uh, make, make money and survive with their families. Okay, so there was a lot of um, prejudice here in America and this Chinese Exclusion Act ended up lasting, being renewed multiple times and being extended until about 1943. What the impact that this law had is number one, the Chinese could not petition to become a citizen in the United States. And this is quite interesting because at this time, after so many years, you might have American born Chinese by this time, but they could not be considered American citizens or have the benefits of being a citizen. So there were a lot of uh, difficulties with regard to this. It wasn't until 1943 when the Chinese could then become American citizens. And this did not happen all at once, but it was more of a trickle. There was a cap, a number on how many Chinese could actually immigrate. So imagine that, that a relative was here, but his wife was left in China. It may have been years before he was able to bring his wife or his children back. Uh, or to the United States. Uh, now, during this time, the benefit for us is that there were some amazing records created as a result of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And these records are immigration records that um, are mostly known as A files in the United States. And I'll talk just briefly about those, but they may, these records um, contain interviews, questions asked, and answered, and the questions that are over a hundred questions, sometimes even more than that, and the responses. And the questions asked sometimes were, what village are you from? And what is your Chinese name with character? And so these records may be, be used to find that key information in order to do genealogical research. Um, okay, so the Exclusion Act was repealed. After this time, you may be able to find naturalization records which also will contain some details about where your ancestor was from. Okay, now here we have some additional interesting things with regard that's specific to Chinese genealogy. So I mentioned already that your ancestor may have had multiple names. Well, they may have had, uh, when you're here in America, and you usually say your name a certain way with the last name first, and a census taker comes by, for example, is a census taker going to write your last name as your first name? 
is he going to know to switch it? Or are you going to know to switch it? And so here's some of the difficulties as you're finding, looking for your ancestors in these records, the last name may be, may be entered as the first name. It may have been put in reverse. Another common thing, um, many times a person was called by the name Ah, uh, Ah Lin, Ah Chen, Ah something. And the Ah is a little bit kind of, kind of like an endearment or a diminutive where uh, it's a, a kind, uh, close way to call somebody, but that's not really their official name. However, that's the name that's going to appear in some of these records. So the ah isn't really named, but you may see it uh, recorded that way in some records. Okay, another problem is uh, this southern area in China where ma many of the early ancestors came from spoke Cantonese, which is uh, different, they write the same characters, Cantonese and Mandarin, but they pronounce the characters differently. And then even within that area, there are many dialects. And so depending on the way that your ancestor said the name, it would be written phonetically or the way it sounded in the census or other records. So imagine, and maybe this will help you understand, imagine somebody saying a name uh, with a southern accent or an eastern accent. It might sound differently even though it's the same name. And this is one of the problems that you may run across. I have one more slide here uh, talking about the different name issues. Uh, the Chinese characters were written in traditional Chinese. Again, during this uh, interesting upheaval of economic and political time in the 1900s in China, one of the changes that was made was to change some of these more difficult traditional Chinese characters into simplified. And so your character, your family name character may be represented in two different ways and knowing what those two different ways are would be important. And then there were different ways to romanize Chinese characters from English or from Chinese to English. And there were different systems. There was a wide jail system that was used from 1859, Kenyon, and this is actually the one that is most common in use right now. But depending on which, which system was used, the romanization of that name could be different. So I use the character Sha for this example, and this is how it is written in Kenyon. But here is how it is written in Wild, Wild, Wade Giles. Um, and then here's how it's pronounced in Cantonese and these different dialects. So we have a, a wide range. So being familiar that, that there are possibilities, what was the dialect or the, the language that your ancestors spoke, depending on where they came from, will help you with this uh, character romanization uh, piece. And in the back on the resources, I actually have a recommendation of a book that a friend of mine in Canada wrote that deals with some of the issues with the, the Chinese name and, and making a change from the character to romanization. And she has some great strategies and help in that book and I, I've got reference to it in the end. Okay, so again, let's go back to what our goal is. We're trying to find the, the family name character and the ancestral village name. So one of the easiest ways, maybe, is to find it on a tombstone. Uh, many, if you find one of your relative's tombstones using the Chinese characters, that will be helpful to you. This particular tombstone actually tells you where the originating family was. Here we see China, Guangdong, and Taishan, and then it goes down to tell the, the more, the small location. On this particular side, we have uh, the name of the person that died. This is a couple tombstone. And over here, we have information about birth and death. And these are actually dates. And over here in red, um, this person is the spouse that is still alive. And they've painted red because red is lucky. And this person is not yet dead. But when the person has died, they will add the additional information for the death date and this will change to white. So tombstone may give you that surname character 
as well as the village. The immigration records that I talked about that as a result of the Chinese Immigration Act, uh, the A files, uh, they will have some, inf some information of, that could help you about the, the ancestral village and the surname characters. So those would be helpful to look into. And then the Netherlands associations may be helpful. Okay, now records in the United States that could help you find information about your family. These are records that if you've done some research before, you may be familiar with, but ship's passenger list may have recorded your ancestor as he arrived, he or she arrived. Immigration records, these are the NARA, the National Archives Records Administration case files, these uh, specifically the A files. Um, maybe they had a business here. Uh, very industrious and very likely uh, they're listed in a business or city directory for multiple years. You may be able to find them in the U.S. and federal census, the U.S. federal census, and maybe state records, state census records. There are some states that have state census records. Illinois happen to be one of those. Um, and I'll have some examples here. Your ancestor may be found in military records, such as draft registration or service records. They may be found in vital records. These would be birth, marriage, and death. If they were born in China, they may not have a birth record here, but maybe they married here or maybe they died here. So those records could be uh, exist. The Social Security Death Index, another great resource that could give birth information and death information. Cemetery and funeral home records also could give some good information. Next, I'm going to show you two websites where these records are available for searching. The first website is familysearch.org. This is a free website. Uh, you do need to create an account to use this site. It's a free account, but this site contains digital images and indexes of many of the records, in fact, probably all the different records that we talked about on the last slide. So this is where you would create an account and sign in. And then they've got a menu bar up here. Go to search. And it will bring up a search box here and a map of the world here. I suggest that you go down to this where this uh, field is. And below it says browse all published collections. If you go there, it will bring up alphabetically the collections. And you may want to start by searching records in the state you know they lived in. And you can put the state name here and it will list all the collections within that state that are available. Now you'll notice in this particular one, starting with Alabama, we have a lot of different collections and some of these collections have a camera icon. That camera icon means that these are actual images of, in this case, Alabama death records. Uh, those without icons, this means that this particular collection is an index of the Alabama County marriage records covering these years. And then if you look over here, this tells you the, the number of images or records in that collection and when they were last updated. Okay, some collections found on family search that are specific uh, to the Chinese. Here's a list of some I know that family search is always adding and updating collections. So this is probably uh, will be current for a short time and then there will be more over time. But look, here we have uh, three, four collections here specific to California, uh, Chinese partnership and departures from San Francisco, San Diego Chinese passenger and crew list, uh, San Francisco Chinese passenger list, San Francisco Register of Chinese Immigrant Court Cases and Foreign Seamen Tax Cards. Here we have one for Hawaii State Archives, the Chinese Immigration Labor Record Permits, uh, Pennsylvania Case Files of Chinese Immigrants, and uh, this one's again California Records of Chinese Laborers Returning to the U.S. In this one, you can see that this uh, covers that that time frame when the Chinese Exclusion Act began in 1882. Um, during the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act, 
the Chinese that were here in the United States could leave to visit their family in China and could return, but there was a lot of paperwork uh, that governed their ability to come and go. And so you will find that paperwork in these kinds of collections. Okay, Family Search also has some general collections where you may find your ancestor. Again, census records, passenger lists, immigration records, and, and these are probably mostly indexes. Uh, state, uh, city and business directories, military discharge records and draft registration, uh, vital records, birth, marriage and death. Uh, we have the social security death index and funeral home and cemetery records and naturalization records. Okay, another site that I would encourage you to search on as well. This is ancestry.com and it is a subscription website. And I heard um, yesterday that those of you that are um, have library cards from the library actually have access to Ancestry at home up through June. And I think we can give out some more information about that at the end of the presentation if you're interested. Uh, this site also contains digital images and indexes. And the way you navigate this site is go to search and we have a list of the different categories. They have grouped the records into different categories. So depending on what you want to look for, you can click census and search that, a search field will come up, or you can search immigration, military, any of those uh, that are of interest. And here are some collections specific to the Chinese that are found on Ancestry. We have Chinese Arri Arrival Case Files Index uh, this is a great place to go to get information that will allow you to get into those case files in the future. Uh, California mortuary, mortuary records of Chinese descendants. We have index to Chinese exclusion case files, certificates of identification for Chinese arrivals, uh, index to Chinese exclusion case files. It looks like I've got that here twice. One's for California, one's for Hawaii. Um, many immigrants arrived in Hawaii first, and then came to California. And so Hawaii has some great records. Here we have another one in New York, uh, Chinese exclusion case files, North Dakota and Washington, Chinese arriving passengers, arrivals and dispositions, uh, Oregon, Chinese immigrant landing records, application for admission, San Francisco, Chinese laborers returning to the US, uh, again, Chinese arriving passenger arrivals, and uh, U.S. Naval Intelligence personal duty locations and Chinese muster rolls, Chinese immigration case files, and here we have one for Canada, uh, British Columbia manifest of Chinese arrivals. So again, both of these sites are always adding new records. Um, so search for those and see what you might find. And again, Ancestry has some general collections. These are parallel the collections that were on Family Search, so you will see the same categories. Oh, and something I want to mention here, I did add on this one, border crossings and passports. Uh, because of the strict laws with regard to the Chinese Immigration um, or the Chinese Exclusion Act, some uh, immigrants arrived in Mexico hoping that they could cross the border into America or Canada. And so you may find something interesting. I have some samples here, record samples of what these records look like and the kind of information that you might be able to find on them. This is a ship's passenger list and we have the names written out and they've asked for their age and occupation. Sometimes they'll give more information. Sometimes they ask where they're headed to. Um, so that will give you a clue if you've got the right person. Here's another passenger list. This one happened to be uh, typed out, uh, but these are actually ship's crew. And so we can see their occupation here. And here we have information on their height and weight as well. Here we have another one. This one is handwritten and uh, it says place of birth. And here we have a uh, city or village. So this may be very helpful. The port of entry, again, height, physical, um, physical description. OK, 
Okay, the immigration case files. I actually, um, there's just not enough room to put enough on this page here, but usually these files are pages and pages long, detailing the questions that were asked. And many times the questions will describe family members and where they lived. And sometimes it may even ask about uh, where the ancestral hall is located and other interesting things. Here's a business directory. Uh, I, can't, I can't see right off where this is from, uh, but here we have information about the person that he's a, a physician. In this case, uh, probably an herbalist or uh, a Chinese uh, physician. Many times uh, they may have had a restaurant that would be listed here as well. Here's another one. And here we have uh, more examples, but it gives their address and if they're working where they worked. And you can look at these over multiple years to see if um, they're still there or if they've moved on. But this gives you a, a place to pinpoint where they are located. The census records can be a helpful resource for you. One of the, one of the best categories in the census from 1880 forward is this column called citizenship. Here we have a whole group of people from China. This first column is asking where this person was born. The next two columns ask, where was your father born and where was your mother born? Then we have information on, tell us what year you arrived in the United States. If you know when they arrived, it can narrow down your search for a passenger list. And then number of years here. And this AL indicates that they are an alien meaning they are not a citizen, but may, they may have been registered as uh, an alien uh, in registration. Here's the 1920 census. Again, it's giving uh, similar information under citizenship, and we have years of arrival. Uh, this particular census, well, from 1880 on, this does. In this case, we, it looks like we have a family, and it will tell we've got the head of household, a wife, a son, a son, and a lodger. Uh, gives information about parentage and about occupation and, and age. Anyway, so I just threw out some examples here. Again, um, this one, this group here, we have uh, working in the restaurant as a cook. Here we have longer. Um, I've seen Taylor. I've seen all kinds of different occupations there. Okay. Some states had state census records, and uh, Illinois happened to be one of those, and I just pulled that out, this particular one, uh, as an example. But depending on which state your ancestor lived in, you might be able to find them in state census records. This one happened to be for the year 1865. And other than giving the name of the head of household, uh, other family members were represented by tally marks here. But uh, here we, we are in an agricultural area. They're asking um, the value of livestock, um, number of pounds of wool, and that may be interesting, whether they served in the militia. Okay, other records that your ancestor may be found in, military just discharge records. Uh, here we have an honorable discharge for Wong Perry, and it gives information about his service. Along with that, in those records, uh, you'll probably have information about birth as well. Draft registration records. These are records for those that signed up for the draft for either World War I or World War II. And in this case, uh, the, the general questions they ask is your name and your residence. And they ask your age and his place of birth and date of birth and address of person who will always know where you're at. Often that's a relative um, or maybe a close relative. And then on the back side of the card, there's a physical description. Vital records include birth, marriage, and death certificates. And here we have uh, uh, George Lin, Hui Yun, George Lin. And it gives his name of a uh, spouse. It gives names of parents, 
And even though it doesn't give us a specific place in China, it does tell us China. And having a name is a good start. We see his occupation and his age. Here's another vital record. This one is uh, handwritten. And this is for uh, Yong Li. And he's a cook. And again, information about family. And here's a marriage license. Harry Lee of Chicago, and Minnie Wong of Chicago. And then here's an example of a different type of marriage record. Louis Lee and uh, Charles Lee. Oh, this is his father. Okay, so this is the groom and the bride is over here. And it gives their age and where they were born. The Social Security Death Index is an index that is created for those um, that have died and had a Social Security card and actually collected on it. And here we have um, information about uh, Tang Yu Zhang, and we have the birth date and the death date and the state of residence. Here we have another one, Chang Kai Wong. Um, from Los Angeles, California, a birth date and a death date. Funeral home records, uh, these can be uh, very helpful. Sometimes they contain more information than the actual tombstone. So if you can find the funeral home, these records um, are, can be good. Again, uh, here we have uh, some different people, their age, where they were born and where they the tombstone is located and who the undertaker was. And there are more over here, senior, 25 years, um, unknown. And then this would be identified where he's buried. And then the tombstones, as I pointed out before. Again, this one uh, shows Guangdong, Nanhai. Um, and over here, uh, we have mother and their names, and this is saying I've gone down here. So it may give you information that could be helpful. And then we have naturalization and citizenship records. Okay, these records will only be available after 1943. Anytime you find your ancestor on the census, from before 1943, they will always be an alien because they were not allowed to be citizens until after 1943. But from that time, you may get some interesting detailed information from the naturalization and citizenship records. Uh, there are a lot of great questions. Uh, here we have, uh, where do you live? A full name. And uh, we have a description. We have, uh, he's saying he was widowed and this was his wife and uh, where he was born, where she was born, when he arrived in the United States, and so forth. Many times if there are children, they'll list out the children and their birth dates and birthplaces as well. So these are great um, records to get access to. Here's another one. Um, and this one is from Cook County. And it actually says, this, is, this stands for Guangdong, Toysen, China. This is where a lot of uh, Ancestors came from around uh, Luke York. And uh, this, this will be more than one page. You'll have multiple pages in this uh, citizenship packet, naturalization. And here's a petition for naturalization. Usually becoming a citizen was a two-part process. And the first papers, which is the petition, and second papers, which is the actual naturalization filing. And these were often filed uh, maybe three to five years apart. But again, look at the detail and in the information we can get here. Okay, so lots of stuff, but that's not everything, right? <laughs> What's next? What if I do all of this stuff? I start talking to my relatives, gathering the information, and I've identified, I'm able to identify after searching the records, my ancestor, my family surname, and the village. Where do I go from there? Or maybe you already have a Jaku and you have access to it. And here's two different examples of a page out of each of two different kinds of Jaku. Um, well, then you need some tools 
and resources to help you uh, go the next step and identify relatives through these books. And again, I want to stress you can do this without knowing the language well. Um, and, and I've got some resources that I'll list for you here, but that's a more in-depth class that will take more time. But it is possible and it can be done and it's an exciting adventure. So let's look at some of the resources and tools that I've added in the syllabus that may help you. Pleco is a, an app that you can put on your phone and it's free. And this, this, I use this all the time, not only to type up um, uh, a name or a word, it will allow me to draw a character with my finger and then it will give me the definition of that. Uh, so this has been a really helpful tool and I believe it works both on um, Android and Apple. And there is a version that you can upgrade to if you want, but I, I use this one all the time when I'm working with characters. Uh, and one of the things that I found interesting here is you can set it to um, simplified or traditional. I'm usually working in the old record, so I have it set to tra traditional, but it will give you modern meanings and it will give you archaic meaning, meanings. And when in what I'm working with, usually the archaic mean, meanings apply. Okay, some other resources. We talked a little bit about um, benevolent associations. I went to this website. This is the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association of Chicago. And within their own homepage, they have a list of members across the United States, a meaning member organization. So uh, here are some of the other members organizations. And usually these organizations were originally set up by surname, family surname. So here we see a family, a Wong family, Ng family, Li family. Um, but let's see if I think we go out here. And then we have uh, some of these organizations uh, from San Francisco all the way across the United States, Hawaii and, and other places, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. So if your family lived in any of those areas, you can contact and see if they might have some resources and information about your family. Another website I think is very valuable and helpful at an organization, the Chinese Family History Group of Southern California. This is kind of a subgroup of the, the Southern California group that was mentioned about the uh, jamboree being held in the summer. This is a, a group that you can sign up for their newsletter and they have some resources. And one of the resources I wanted to pull out is they have this guide um, for researching Chinese family history. And it's, it's well worth um, the $38, either $30 for the online version. Uh, helps, again, giving resources and tools, helps you get started trying to figure out how do you convert the characters into uh, romanization and how do you put that in documents. And it gives you all some details like that that will help you. Um, another group that has been fun that I've associated with has been the Bay Area Chinese Genealogy Group. Uh, they have webinars and, and their focus is Chinese genealogy. They also have newsletter and activities. And then the Chinese Historical Society of America, again, another resource. This, this society may not have documents for you, but uh, there's a lot of information about cultural and cultural events and uh, opportunities. And then uh, I mentioned this one earlier. This is a book that a friend of mine recently published and she's in uh, Canada. And it does very well with addressing the naming issues and some strategies that you may need to use as you're looking for your ancestor in the records in English. And so this is a great book. And then last fall, I just want to mention, as was mentioned earlier in my uh, biography, I will be teaching a virtual course uh, about Chinese ancestry in the fall. And if you're at all interested, just send me an email. Um, that information was on the handout and I can give you more details about it. But uh, this is a course that will actually cover about 11 weeks 
and over, over 20 hours of instruction. Okay, I think it's time now for questions. So I will stop sharing my screen and see what we can do here. Thank you very much, Kelly. That was great. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, there was one fairly early on uh, that that says, um, I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to trace my Chinese great grandfather, Charles Leo, AKA Liu Him, and has the Chinese characters per his headstone. Uh, we only have two photos, his headstone and a few documents. Is there any hope? I, I didn't say there's always hope. There's always hope. And sometimes you can't make the connection straight from your ancestor. And it's really important when you're doing Chinese research to look at you, the people your ancestor is associated with, um, whether they're relatives or business partners, because often they began this business or this association because they have a, a similar, they came from the same place in China. And so you may be able to make connection that way. But you mentioned the tombstone. If the tombstone has Chinese characters there's a pretty good chance that that ancestral village will be identified. And I, I just want to stress um, over 90% of the overseas Chinese that came, came from uh, Guangdong province. And so even though you don't know where, we can kind of narrow it down. Uh, and so there are possibilities. Don't give up. Don't give up. And kind of expanding on that, uh, what's the best way to research Chinese American genealogy using resources in China? Is there anything there that's that can help question. us? Um, that's a great question. I actually haven't thought of it in that direction. But when I went to China, I went, uh, I spent some time at Wuyi University and um, Dr. Celia Tan, her specialty is overseas Chinese. And she collects information in China about the Chinese that left and kept in contact and communication. And so, yes, yeah, she's a great resource and uh, they've set up villages there. Uh, she was instrumental in um, uh, setting up uh, UNESCO sites, World Heritage sites uh, from these communities where people left and came to America. And they, they're trying to preserve the culture in hopes that their descendants will come back and want to have a look into what the life was like. So um, yeah, there, there is an interest on that side of, of knowing what happened and, and they have museums and all kinds of great things. Um, there was another question. Uh, what are the Mexican and Canadian resources for doing Chinese American genealogy? I think you had mentioned the collections about uh, border crossings and things like that, but are there any other resources you'd recommend? Um, yes, so for Canada, uh, they have similar records of immigration in their national archives. And uh, it has a unique system from the, our system but it does have similar records. And so I, I do know a lot of um, Canadian Chinese that, uh, yeah, that, that are able to do research with that. And so there's, there's a whole group in Canada or multiple groups that have been very successful in going through those records. Now in Mexico, it's not as uniform or organized as uh, what you would find in Canada. Um, and so again, it depends on the time frame when they arrived, but the immigration records within Mexico aren't of, of the strength of those in the US and Canada. So you'd have to look at other records. And, and as you probably know, um, everywhere there was a, a Chinese ethnic population, there was a, a Chinatown that was created in the area. And uh, within that area, and that's may maybe what you would have to do within Mexico, is uh, 
address, identify where that area is and see what kinds of records within you know, they might have. Okay, thank you. Um, there was another question specifically about the Chinese Exclusion Act that you may have touched on before, but if you okay. can expand on it a little bit. Was the Chinese Exclusion Act still subject to the 14th Amendment, which states that all persons born in the United States are US citizens? Even if the direct immigrants could not become citizens, did this apply also to their US born children? That is a great question. And there were actually court cases um, as a result of that, because there were, by the second generation, there were a lot of Chinese Americans that were born here um, and this is all they ever knew. And um, it wasn't an easy, straight, oh yes, they're accepted. Um, it, it, it was a very long, delayed, difficult struggle to become a citizen. And it, it had to do a lot with the prejudice um, that was here, which is so unfortunate. Yeah, and that's touched on a little bit in the Interior Chinatown book, if anyone wants to read about that. Um, there is a fairly long question that I'll read to you. A question about source of information on ship passenger lists. My father was born in 1924 in China. His father was born in South Dakota in 1889. So grandfather was born in China and immigrated to America prior. Uh, on the passenger list when my father came over for the first time from Hong Kong to San Francisco in 1946, He's listed as a yes for US citizen. I realize this is after 1943, wondering if any documents were required for the information on the passenger lists. I am wondering on the details of how my father got to be listed as a US citizen on the passenger list. Great question. Yes. So that passenger list, can you, what year was that? What year did they come back? 1946. Nice. Okay, so any time prior to 1943, any time a Chinese um, left or came to America, there was a whole bunch of paperwork, documentation, records kept. He left so that when he comes back, we know. And and the person themselves had to carry documentation to present when they arrived. So this would be after that time. And I, I believe that, uh, I wonder if they're making some assumptions because I don't think the documentation um, trail would have been as, as rigid at this time. Actually, there was actually there was a limit though on how many could come. So there, yes, I, I'm thinking there would be documentation. And, and while we're talking about this, I, this is a little bit off subject, but it's something I didn't have a chance to mention. Um, so another problem that you may run across with your Chinese ancestors is in the early 1900s in San Francisco, there was a San Francisco earthquake. And this was the, a port where many Chinese were coming into. And so all of those detailed records were destroyed. And this caused an opportunity for more Chinese to come in and they came in as, and they were called paper sons or paper daughters. And these were, when you have a Chinese person here and he says, I have three sons in China, I want to bring them over. Maybe he only had one son, but he said he had three and then he could sell the other two slots. And two other people would come in under the, his surname and so it wasn't their official surname, but these are paper sons and daughters. And again, because of that earthquake, um, we have a lot of paper names, people with paper names, and they'll find they have two names. So that was a little off subject, but something not to forget about. And for any of that paperwork, uh, when people are coming over, is that going to be in the NARA files or where would they find that? Um, yeah. And, and there are, um, like San Bruno is, is the place you want to go to for San Francisco. Um, but yeah, and now the access to them is becoming a little more restricted. Uh, but they are well worth getting those files and they're often very thick. And sometimes they contain amazing um, things. 
It may contain photographs of a couple when they're saying they're married. It may contain other information that you just wouldn't find anywhere. I would say if there's any chance your ancestor had one, it's worth getting that file. The whole file, not just part of it, the whole file. Okay. Um, one more quick question. Is there a good database for Chinese DNA? So I guess for people to do their DNA. You know, a, a lot of people are interested and that's a great question. So when I went to China, I had um, one of the people I went with actually brought a DNA kit or two because he wanted to find out connections. And that's actually restricted and against the law in China. They don't want any of the DNA samples to be taken out of China. However, I heard and I believe that the Chinese government is creating a DNA database. And um, I, this was several years ago, I talked with a, a business that was Qing Time, that was working to create an app for the Chinese, but also for those in America that have Chinese ancestry. And the goal of this app was to connect the DNA where you could put in your surname and your own DNA and you could identify where your ancestral location was because other people in this area have the same DNA. Anyway, it was a fascinating project, but I don't know the progress on it. And I, I do believe that China has this kind of database or is creating it. But outside of China, um, there are fewer samples, people that, that, that test. And so, yeah, I wish there was one great one, but I'm still listening around to see if there's something that's great. Um, we had a question um, about, uh, okay, so is there an online resource for converting old village names and Chinese characters to names of modern places? So is there any way to link the two? Uh, that's a great question. Off the top of my head, I don't have that, but I, I do believe there are resources. So if you have the name of, and if your ancestor came from the Guangdong area, uh, the, the, there are actually uh, three to five counties there where the bulk of the people came from, there is a database um, called uh, it's called a village database. I'm trying to think if it's called anything else. Village database. And then maybe you could say Chinese. Um, that was created so you can identify um, maybe a partial name of a village. It would show you where that village is and it will identify it. And I, I think it identifies it on a modern map. So, the, yeah. And that database was created uh, because as a result of the immigration records, it was really quite interesting how it came about. But, but it is possible, that's not my uh, expertise, but I do know that when I went with a group of Chinese Americans to China, prior to going, uh, they contacted the university and uh, they oversaw a program, the Wu Yi University, and the students, were paired with individuals, with the families that wanted to visit families in China. And they did the legwork beforehand of finding the village and identifying uh, living relatives. So it's possible to have to do, it's not impossible. So it is possible. I just don't have all the details on that. Thanks. Um... There is another question uh, specifically about someone's family. So my wife's grandfather came to the US as a King Dynasty diplomat in 1907 to 1911. Where can I find information on him? I did find the shipping manifest of his arrival or the ship manifest of his arrival. Well, that's good. Uh, so, he, so he came and he actually stayed, is that correct? Sounds like it, yes. Yeah, sounds like it. So even if uh, he came as a diplomat, if he became a citizen, uh, the naturalization citizenship records would include details about him. 
And uh, he would not, again, he came in uh, from 1907 to 1911. So he would not have been able to file for the paperwork until after 1943. So yeah, that's when I would look for it was after that time. Okay. Um, what has your experience been using family associations for genealogical research? Great question. And I have very little experience using family associations, but um, understanding how they worked and why they were set up, I makes me believe that I know these records were created. Whether or not they still exist is another thing. Here's an interesting little thing. Um, initially, the Chinese came to work with every intention to return home. And when they bought a ticket to come to America, they actually paid a round trip fee. And the reason they did that was in the case, in the instance that they died here, they wanted their bones to be returned. This was really important that they be buried with their family. And so it was these associations that handled this uh, returning the bones to the ancestral village. So they had to have the information. And uh, this, this process was, was actually over a period of years. The, the person would be buried here. And then after three to seven years, they'd be um, exhumed and their bone remains would be sent to China, to the village. And many of these were sent and some have, have stayed and got stuck. In Hong Kong, initially, uh, they were stuck when the Japanese uh, closed off the borders in China. But it's interesting, all around the world, they have found in places where they have funeral homes where these bones are waiting to be sent. And that was just part of that original thing. So this is why I believe there, there were records created where those records are, if they are still with the association, that's, that's another thing. So that's why you have to contact each individual one and any that might have your surname as a, as a your surname as character. Um, there's a chance that your ancestor had association with that that benevolent association. All right, thank you. And one last question. Uh, what do you suggest for translating Chinese documents from my grandparents? So if they have documents at home, how do they get those translated? So you can, you can look for somebody uh, that's willing to translate uh, that may have that. And I would, I'd actually suggest if you live near a university where they have a program, a language program, that you will probably find students or um, TAs that would be able to do that at a, a discounted rate. <laughs> or maybe even an older relative, yeah, an older relative in the family, yeah, maybe. All right, well, thank you very much. I hope I got to all of the questions. Um, thank you so much for for coming and talking to us about this. It's a very, very interesting topic. And uh, I think we all learned a lot. Um, you know, thank you to Kelly. Thank you for North Suburban Genealogical Society for helping to host this event. Um, I did want to mention also that we did record this. So if you are interested in getting the recording to send to somebody who, um, you know, wasn't able to attend today, send me an email. I'll put my email address um, in the chat and also you would have gotten my email address with the handout. Sorry, trying to type and talk at the same time. Um, so if you'd like to get a link to the recording to send to someone else, just send me an email and I'll make sure you get it. Um, thank you all for coming today. Is there anything else? Terry or Linda or Kelly, you'd like to, to mention? Well, thank you very much, Kelly. It was a great presentation. I think a lot of people really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. And the North Suburban Society, would, Genealogical Society, would like to thank Wilmette Library, Eva Ann, and Jane for support. Uh, 
our relationships with the local libraries is very important and we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.